there's uh, unblocks that talked about Ruby's blocks or something like that, or that's what it was supposed to be, I don't know. For those who don't know me, I'm James Overgrader II. Um, I've been in the Ruby community quite a while now, not as long as some, but longer than most. I've uh, written several things you may have seen, including the faster CSV library that became the standard CSV library in Ruby 1.9. I build relevant applications for a living. Uh, one you may have seen recently was uh, Go versus Go, which I built with Ryan Bates uh, during the Rails Rumble. Uh, and that was fun. I've also sometimes been caught impersonating Jim Wyrick. I have no <laughs> idea why. Uh, yeah. I'm going to be nice and leave him alone today. The other thing you really need to know about me, though, is this. Um, if you've seen any of my talks before, you know, I love these pop culture references, Heroes, Battlestar Galactica. I used video game once, Little Big Planet. I've even used my vacation photos from Japan. How cool is that? Um, by the way, this tree, I believe Rich Kilmer once showed a tree in a talk at Lone Star RubyConf. This is from my own photos, and I believe it is the exact same tree Rich Kilmer showed in Japan. So we both traveled all the way to Japan and got obsessed over the same tree, <laughs> right? How wild is that? Okay, but I'm not cool anymore because I'm a dad now. And, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Uh, this is my daughter, James Edward Gray III. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Her name is Summer. Um, uh, as my wife's doctor is fond of telling me, dads are not cool, they're weird. Okay, so I'm not cool anymore. She always says that because her dad once dropped his watch in the, the taper pond at the zoo and went in after it. <laughs> Yikes. Okay, so the reason dads aren't cool is we can really only think about two things. Okay, the first one is, where is our next hit of caffeine coming from? And I just didn't drink an entire Dr. Pepper before I did this speech, so that's why I'm wired. Uh, the other thing we can think about is playing, okay? That, uh, that's what we're programmed to do. Which, by the way, if you guys don't know this, this is why you have kids. Did you know it's socially acceptable for me to play with Legos again? <laughs> That's awesome. Go out and get a kid right now. Don't wait on that birthday. It's <laughs> too long. Just steal one or something. <laughs> it's way too long. Uh, okay, so Summer has all these great toys, right? And uh, I want to show you one. These are uh, some blocks, some alphabet blocks, ABCs, teach your ABCs. Uh, but they're from the point of view of everything a young mad scientist would need to know. So, like, F is for freeze ray, right? <laughs> you might need to know that. Or U is for underground layer. Uh-huh, everybody needs to know about that, right? It goes all the way down to Z is for zombies. Yeah. And why do you need to know about zombies if you're a young mad scientist? Well, because of this. Right? <laughs> Obviously. Okay. Oh yeah, I'm supposed to be talking about Ruby's blocks. Uh, in case you haven't noticed, I'm not doing that. Actually, there's been some doubt about my ability to talk about Ruby's blocks. You can almost hear Jeremy's question here when I tell him they uh, took my blog talk and it's always like, you're going to talk about blocks for 30 minutes? No, the talks are 45. <laughs> But he's right, I'm not going to talk about boring old blocks, not the usual boring stuff you're used to. These are experiments with blocks, right? And uh, with the words of Dave Thomas, they're meant to inspire. And I'm so glad he said it was okay to do it worse, because we're definitely going to. <laughs> These blocks might be, or examples might be described as maniacal. Um, that's definitely true. And I've already given you the reason for that is because I'm on caffeine, right? Okay, so this is the evil blocks talk. Okay? So let's start off with a quiz. Why is for you the mad scientist of tomorrow 
So let's see how you do, mad scientists. I'm gonna pose a problem. Let's say we have this Ruby construct. We have a table, right? And we're storing it by rows and columns. So we have rows and then columns A, B, C. And we wanted to find that simple indexing method, pair brackets, and then we wanna to try to get the three inside, right? And there's a lot of ways we could do this. I'll show you a couple. Uh, the most easy way is we could delegate to the underlying array, right? Uh, so we just write here when uh, the first value gets passed in, we pass that on to the underlying array, that'll return the array of the row, and do that. The weird thing about that is then we have to pass it in kind of backwards for us humans, right? Y then X, right? But usually we think in terms of X then Y. So that's a little bit backwards. To fix that, there's several ways we can fix that. This is probably the best idea. If we just take both of those values at once, the X and the Y, we can swap them right here and pass them both in there. And then that lets us call it with X comma Y, which is very natural and it's a good idea, right? This talk is not about good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. So we're throwing this slide away. Okay, so I actually want to do a bad idea. I want to do it the way I did it in the first slide with brackets, brackets, but I want to pass X, Y. So I want to come up with a line of code that goes right here and allows us to do X, Y like this. Pop quiz, any suggestions? Shout it out. Return a lambda. Return a lambda, that is so cool. All right. <laughs> I'll show you a more pedestrian way first. How about transpose? Anybody know this method? Array, you can have an array of arrays flipped around in Ruby, right? So that it'll change it to go by columns instead of by rows. Um, and usually it's easier to store it by row because, uh, you know, when we're printing it out or things like that, it makes it easier. But if we want to access it the other way, we can transpose it first. <coughs> This could get expensive though, right? If we have a lot of data in there and uh, we're constantly having to flip it around just to get at the data, or uh, we're maybe having to save two copies of it, even worse. So this could get really expensive. So uh, that's transpose. The other answer that was offered is let's return a lambda, which is an awesome <coughs> answer and it's right, it works. The reasons that it works is kind of interesting though. So let's look into these a little bit. First, you have to know what a lambda is. So we kind of got to get into some block jargon, just a little bit. Um, and a lambda, this is a simplification, but I'm sure you've seen a method like this before in Ruby, where you put the ampersand in there and it will bundle the block up into an object for you. So, and then we can do something with that block inside the method, right? So lambda can almost be defined like this. It's not really, this is a, a simplification, but um, it basically just bundles it up into an object and immediately returns that object. So it allows you to invoke a block anywhere when you wouldn't otherwise have a block, right? It's like a stand-in method to generate blocks is the way to think of it. Well, why would you want to create a block where you can't create a block? To get the answer, we'll go to Java, obviously. Um, so uh, this is some Java code. And uh, it's just, it just sums up five numbers, simple stuff, right? Um, but in Java, this is common sense here. Um, you would want to be able to access this variable in this loop, right? If you couldn't, Java would make you even more mad than it already makes you, right? <laughs> okay, so here's the equivalent program in Ruby. And like uh, usual as Ruby, we drop all the loops and replace them with iterators, right? So there are blocks. And we, in order to get that same thing, in order to be able to access that outside variable, blocks have to be closures, which is this scary computer science word we throw around, but it really just means that they can access the surrounding environment so that they don't make you mad in simple situations like this, right? Okay, so that's the quality of blocks that we care about. The last point that you really need to understand how that example I showed works is duct typing. And here's the pretty canonical example that we tend to see, which is with this append method right here, right? And the idea is that everything supports this append method. So we can append to arrays, we can append to strings, uh, we can append to file objects, et cetera, right? But my favorite duct typing method is not append. It's the indexing method, the brackets. 
Everything supports this sucker too. Look at these examples. String, array, hash, and lambda supports the indexing method as well. It's an alias for call, right? So anywhere you could use a hash to look something up, you could use a lambda instead to calculate something instead, right? So let's go back and look at that example I gave you one more time. You can see all the tricks here. So we're using a lambda so that we can grab a block here when we couldn't otherwise do it, wrap up the context, and the reason we want to do that is so we can gain access to this private instance variable and the x that was passed in, and then down here, when the y gets passed in through that duct typing method, we'll have all the pieces we need and we can sort it all out, right? So I love this example because it reminds me of all the reason blocks are cool in Ruby, okay? As example number one, how are we doing so far? You guys feeling like superheroes or are you feeling more like this? <laughs> all right, let's see if we can bite off more than we can chew. <laughs> All right, so the awesome thing about Ruby is that there's blocks everywhere, right? You already know about iterators. We've got talks about that here. Um, everybody knows about the iterators. But a lot of weird Ruby methods take blocks, like uh, exit takes a block, right? And this allows you to do something when the Ruby interpreter is shutting down. Okay, so in this case, I'm just checking to see if we have an error and printing out a message when we do. It's time to shut down. That's cool stuff, right? And another thing that can take blocks, and this is one of my personal favorites, is class new. You can actually define a class programmatically in Ruby, and the block is the class body, okay? So this allows you to make up things on the fly. So in this case, I've added a, a method to all classes uh, to bring in an audit log version of it. It does that by calling class new. If you pass anything to class new, that's your super class. So in here, we inherit from whatever class it's called on. Then we run through all the public methods and redefine them to do the exact same thing they did before, but first print out a message about what happened. So now I can create an array with an audit log and uh, call some methods on it, and you can see it's printing out what I'm doing to these methods. That's pretty cool, right? All right, so what can we do with this uh, dynamically describing methods? So I thought I would go, uh, this is a, this came up at OKRB recently, and people were talking about how this data, uh, by the way it exists, actually confers some structure about the data. Just by looking at it, we can see that it's a collection of names, and these names have these various attributes. We can already see that from the data itself. All right. So R is for robot, which kind of disappointed me a little bit. I really felt like it should be for Ruby. So we'll just turn it into a Ruby robot, right? We want to parse that XML with uh, no pre-existing knowledge and determine the structure from it. Let's see how we would do that. So here's a simple parse. Uh, regular expressions are my weapon of choice. Uh, for those who know me, you won't be surprised by that at all. Uh, so I didn't use anything cool like Nokogiri, uh, but I'll get back to Nokogiri in a minute. Um, this is a simple parser here that just runs through. I want to, it's not really important that you understand how it works, but uh, I do want to show you a couple things. It works tag to tag, and I do that in Ruby by um, changing the line ending character. When you call each or gets or something like that, you can tell it what you want to use as a line ending character. So here, if we use uh, uh, greater than as the uh, line ending character, I, I think Jeremy actually calls it Waka, um, then uh, we can move tag to tag. And then I parse that as tags with uh, two regular expressions. I am using a cool Ruby 1.9 feature here, though, if you don't know about it. I'm using named captures, I'm naming them, and having Ruby set local variables of the exact same name so that I can access, every, access everything by name instead of dollar sign one, dollar sign two, et cetera. Okay, so uh, that parser relies on some escaping. This is a little more code to kind of round it out. Here's the escaping function and the IO we're gonna read from. Also, I've got the storage prepared for where we're gonna stick the classes when we make them, but we haven't got that far yet, so just don't worry about that for now. And here's the parser. Uh, you can use it just by opening a file, wrap it around it, call the parse method, I'm using some Ruby 1.9 tricks here again for um, 
uh, variables in the block can have defaults now, awesome. And uh, below you can see the prettier hash syntax. And we get these events, right? These parsing events. So here's the start of a tag, another tag that has these attributes, another tag, here's the content, etc. Okay, so it's an event-based event parser. Okay, now we've really got to get into the AP stuff, okay? Uh, into the designing of the classes around the data and the parsing it into objects. So here's the code for that. If you're going to parse a tree structure like XML, the easiest way in the world to do it is with a stack, okay? And uh, we just start with a root context. Every time we go into a new tag, we push that onto the stack. And every time we leave a tag, we pop that back off of the stack. That means whatever's on the bottom of the stack right now, that's the context we're currently in. Okay? And we can use that to figure out where we're going. Given that, as I read new tags and stuff, I just keep track of the attributes on them in a hash by the class. This is the parsing part where it's doing the pushing and popping that I talked about with the uh, stack. And then I'm going to do one dirty trick here and we don't really want to have a names object that contains a bunch of names. Really, we just want to simplify that to a Ruby array. So I'm going to go ahead and collapse a couple of levels. And this isn't perfect. It doesn't work in all cases. But we'll see how far we can make it go. And uh, then I just run through those and turn them into classes, uh, which the code for turning them into classes is almost the same thing. Here's class new, the whole point I showed you this example. Um, and I'm dynamically defining the classes here, right? I'm running through the attributes I found and putting those attributes in uh, so that we can build up this class definition. I also added one thing because it was simple, one line. Uh, I allowed you to pass an enhancement if you want. That enhancement gets included in the class body. So you can actually add like helper methods or whatever you want to make it nicer, right? Uh, I'll show you where that might be useful. One more time with the parsing. You can actually do the whole thing in one pass, but it makes the code much uglier. So here I did it in two. Uh, we got to parse through again to get the objects, right? Now we have the class structure. Let's create the objects. I'm using the same trick here. Make a snag, start with a root object, push and pop to create classes as I, or objects as I go through, and populate the attributes of those objects, etc. Return the results. And then I need to make a pretty interface here. It was easier for me to think about, test, and design in those three pieces I showed you, uh, parsing, classes, and objects. Uh, but nobody wants to have to use it like that, so I define one method that unifies the three of them. And we can try it out. So now I pointed that at the names XML that uh, you saw before. And you can see we get a really Ruby interface here, right? XML.names.map. We can just run through those. We can do things like name middle or map all of those names to their first name, or we'll just call them methods in Ruby, right? And you can see what it prints out at the bottom. All right, so I thought to myself, James, you gotta be honest here, how does it compare against Nokogiri? So here's the same code in Nokogiri, which, you know, I'm totally disappointed to say is shorter and easier, so, yeah. <laughs> um, and the reason it, it uh, won is because of uh, the XPath, right? Nokogiri has XPath, which is a language a mini language designed around searching XML. So it's uh, actually easier to get at the parts you want. It just prints the exact same thing. So then I got to thinking about this, and that means I got whooped by a practical tool when I was trying to make this horrible example, and that really made me mad, right? <laughs> so I did what any good programmer would do, and I assumed the fault lies in the data, not in my code, okay? So if we can just find the right data to feed it, something Noko Gary would choke on, then, then we've got an example, right? Okay, so we're going to look for more palatable foods, right? That was my daughter's Halloween costume, isn't that awesome? Okay, so I went hunting for the most evil XML I could find, and it turns out it's in iTunes. <laughs> Sorry, it is. So these are related, right? The only reason you know that is because iTunes was kind enough to put them on the same line for me to show me they're related, but you can't tell they're related in XML because they're not nested or related to each other, right? And the tags that come after the keys can be arbitrary. So like integer, string, date, whatever, right? You don't know. 
So you cannot expat this, okay? Um, you, you can, uh, yeah, there goes no good years advantage. Woo -hoo -hoo. Um, <laughs> You can't expect this. Um, you could do it with Nokogiri's no node structure, but even that, I think, is pretty complicated since the, it's actually the order of the tags that's the key to put these together. So I wanted to see if I could uh, modify my system to work with that. So here I'm using the enhancements, and the thing is those dictionary objects, so I need to just modify those. I'll redefine some things on the class. And the trick is to unify all the different kinds of values into one list which is what I'm doing here, and then changing them into Ruby objects at the same time. And then I get my way uh, to convert the entire thing to a hash, and I want to do that recursively so that it makes this whole hash structure. And once we do that, notice I can index into this, just like I, uh, I get that specific song we were just looking at, and, and we get this nice little Ruby data structure. Um, and you might be thinking there's a library that does something like this called uh, XML simple, I think that will convert an XML structure to a, a system like this, how it's using arrays. But uh, it too would have the same problems with those tags not being related to each other, so it wouldn't be able to figure it out. Okay, so that's good. We whooped no Gary. I feel better about that example. <laughs> All right, for this last example, uh, we're gonna try a, another weird invention of mine. If you thought the last one was weird, this would be even better. Like a lizard connected to tank tracks with horns. Yeah, I don't know what that picture is. It's an invention. Uh, and we'll do some bioengineering. No, this is block engineering. Uh, I think it should stand for that. And we've got to get out my favorite block for this one. This is absolutely my favorite one in the set. Because this is probably what you guys are going to want to do to me afterwards. But P is for peasants with pitchforks. <laughs> <laughs> I give my daughter the coolest toys. Huh? Those are awesome. I'm expecting to spend quite a bit of time in her principal's office. <laughs> okay, so as we get into example, we need to talk about a Rubyism. This thing right here, this thing that we do, the ampersand colon name, right? This has a name, it's called symbol to prep. But what does that really mean, symbol to prep? Well, it means that there's a method called to prep on the symbol class, right? And this is, again, a simplification, and it's not needed in Ruby 1.9 or Rails, which is where some of the prop came from. Um, but look at what it's doing here. It's, again, delaying this decision with this block context, right? To prop is a name of a method we might want to call, and so we just delay the decision, and then when we finally have a receiver, we'll send that message to it, right? And we can call to proc on things, and and uh, get next strings, or ne uh, this is successor, I guess, uh, whatever, next, the next one. Gets the next string or next uh, number. But the cool thing about this is what happens when we put an ampersand in front of it. If it's the last thing in a method call, and it's got an ampersand in front of it, then Ruby automatically calls to prop, right, and converts it for us. Well, that leads to an interesting question. What else in Ruby has a to proc? Anybody know? Shot in the dark? Lambda, yeah. Lambda, proc, same thing. I don't want to go into that. They're similar, but they're the same. Method. Method has two proc on it. Yes, there is an object in Ruby for representing methods. Right? Let's take a look at this. So you can have a fixed num, and then you can ask for uh, a method on that object. So in this case, the plus method. And it gives you back this object that's called a method. It's a method object. And you can call it normally, just like you could with um, uh, lambda, proc, whatever. Or we can call to proc and convert it ourselves and then pass it values the way we've done before. But look at this. If we put the ampersand in front of it, Ruby's going to call to proc for us and do that, right? So what does that actually mean? Well, it means we can map objects to blocks, right? Anywhere that. We have a block interface, which is like everywhere in Ruby. We can use an object instead, right? So I needed something that we could do cool things just by passing a blocks, like Sinatra. We can create an entire web application just by passing some blocks, right? So here's a simple example. We'll take an, an object, a simple object, an array, and turn it into an entire web application. Okay? <laughs> 
I'm so glad you laughed. I went and explained this example to my wife one night, and I just started cracking up. It was great. I think she thought I'd finally gone over the deep end. Did I mention I don't get a lot of sleep now? Okay, uh, so we're just mapping some URLs to some methods on our right. And we have an entire web application. Check this out. We can enqueue things. One, two, three, right? DQ things, pop them off. Peep what's there. It's two now that we've pulled the one off, etc. We built an entire web application just by mapping some blocks, right? Cool. Okay, the truth is, I just used a whole bunch of dirty tricks right there. So I probably ought to explain some of them. We're going to do a little pen and teller thing here, and I'm going to show you some of what I just did. So uh, there's a lot of dirty tricks in here. First of all, I had to use something where I could control the arguments to lots, right? Because some methods need arguments, like push can take any number. In this case, I'm just passing it one. My original thought was to use rake for this example, but in rake, I couldn't control the arguments as well because they all come in in one hash, and the first argument is always the task itself. So I couldn't really make it bend to my, uh, my crazy example here. Also, I had to choose my methods carefully because Sinatra is expecting like a string to be returned, which is the content to be displayed, or something that responds to each. So I chose methods that you know return the items, the strings I was putting in, or the array, which responds to each, then it'll just feature over it and use that for the content. So those are two of my dirty tricks. The other one was I didn't want all of these to run together, so while I was in queuing them, I added this plus, which is a URL encoded space, right? Uh, so actually, the first item in this array is O and E, but the second item is space TWO, and the third item is space THRE, right? So it's a little disappointing when you see it all explained. It's not near as cool a trick as you thought it was, right? I know, I felt that way too. So I said, James, you got to think of a way to keep this thing alive. So I thought about it, meditated on it a little bit, looked at it from some different angles, you know, and I really put my mind to it. And I said, well, all right, Summer has this wish list, right, that I maintain for her, but she tells me what she wants on it. <laughs> and, uh, these are things we, we want to make sure mommy stays aware of, right? And we might be needing these, especially with Christmas coming up, you know. So uh, things like self-rescuing princess shirt. There's this Wi-Fi robot on here. How cool is that? Um, gyroscopic bowl keeps track of your food so it doesn't spill. You know, it's awesome. Maybe we should add the AR drone instead of the uh, Wi-Fi robot. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, AR drone? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll swap that out. Uh, Okay, so anyways, uh, Summer sometimes wants changes to this. She communicates those to me. And um, she wants changes to this. Well, I haven't built an admin interface or, uh, or anything like that. So that sounded like a perfect opportunity to abuse this <coughs> idea of mine. So let's just map active record to Sinatra. That can't be hard. <laughs> All right, so here is uh, how we're going to do that. We'll just open up the Sinatra application, require a new file that's the admin, and tuck it away behind some URLs so that uh, we have a URL space we can muck with, right? And then here is the entire trick right here. Uh, these lines here, I just require a simple database wrapper and connect my database in the configuration step. It's an active record database back, backed by SQLite, so super simple stuff. Ignore the middle part for now because that's the scary stuff. I'll get to that in a minute. And, uh, but down here, look, I'm doing the same thing I did in the last example, just uh, mapping some URLs to some methods of active record, right? Update attribute, touch, destroy, et cetera. And uh, making URLs for them. Okay, so back to that middle part. The trick is I'm calling all these methods on this magic model object, right? And how did I pull that off? I used simple delegator, which this is so awesome. I'm pretty sure if you go back in Ruby talk, you can find me stating publicly that this uh, object is useless. So, <laughs> perfect thing to use in this example. And, and I wrote the documentation for it, that's right. Um, okay, so simple delegator is basically a nothing object, but you pass it something in and it reconfigures itself to pretend like whatever you passed in, right? So in this case, you pass it a fixed num and now it's a fixed num. 
Um, and then you can later change the underlying object, but all the methods still work the same, just pointing to the new object. Well, the cool thing about this is what if you use it on a class, right? So like right here, I give it to a class, I give it some number, but then I can later change the number out from underneath it without it realizing that I've changed its internal data, right? It's probably pretty evil, but it's cool. Um, okay, let's go back to that middle part. So we make a model that wraps any one of the records, it doesn't matter which one, that just gets it to do the uh, methods right. Then before any of these URLs are resolved, we need to figure out a way to switch it to the right model. And I, had, I was running out of things to abuse in this web application, because I've already appropriated the URLs, right? So I decided we'll use a subdomain to get the object we want. <laughs> yeah, not part of the URL, technically. Um, so uh, we'll just switch the model object to whatever the subdomain lookup provides, right? <laughs> OK, so we get an end result of something like this, where you can do rovio dot, uh, you know, your host, and then admin remove, and it removes the robot. Right? Now, the, to be clear, the URL didn't return this complete page. The URL basically uh, returns nothing useful because uh, Active Record doesn't return anything useful there. But uh, then if you visit the application again, you have this. So it's not a complete interface, but it is a mapping of URLs to Active Record, right? And then uh, Summer thought we should edit the price on this one. Maybe that's the reason Mommy uh, isn't getting it for us. She thinks it's a little too expensive. So. We edit the price to very reasonable, again, the plus being a URL encoded space, and sure enough, it changes. <laughs> or we can select the bowl and then hit the admin and move it to the top. The items are listed in terms of their uh, updated at date, so all we have to do is touch it to get it to bounce to the top, right? And we can edit this web application using this simple URL mapping. All right, I don't know about you guys, but I'm kind of played out and running out of caffeine. Before I go, though, I want to leave you with a bunch of cool blocks. So here's T for tentacles, H for henchmen, A for appendages, N for nanotechnology. I don't know if you can see it on that screen. There's a little dot right in the middle. Also, this next block could probably be considered child abuse. This is K is for potassium. <laughs> right? Due to the periodic table of elements. Oh, yeah, I love that one, too. And S is for self-experimentation, which is really what this talk's been about, and we should all do more of, right? So thank you very much. Woo!